Um, welcome everyone to Chicago Autism Network's virtual parent workshop. Tonight we are excited to have uh, Dr. Ashley Whittington Barnish and Molly White here to present to us. Um, Ashley Whittington Barnish is a licensed clinical psychologist, a board certified behavioral analyst doctoral, and a nationally certified school psychologist. She has over 20 years working with individuals with autism and developmental disabilities across home, school, and center-based settings. In addition to her role as clinical director at Stride Autism Centers, Ashley also serves as the associate professor and university chair of the ABA department at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. And Molly White is the lead board uh, certified behavior analyst at Stride Autism Centers. Molly has experience working with individuals with autism from age two to 63, um, and has also worked with other people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. She is passionate about helping underserved populations gain access to necessary therapy, as well as providing effective supervision and training to ABA professionals and parents. Um, with that, I will turn the time over to Ashley and Molly. Thank you so much for the introductions. All right, so today we're going to okay, talk. Participate with you guys. Okay, um, I just found out, I found this on Invite Event, right? So, yeah. Great. Okay, so we are going to um, talk a bit about defining and addressing challenging behavior. And we are from Stride Autism Centers, as, as explained. Um, so the plan for tonight is um, to do some brief introductions, which we, we won't repeat all of the information that was just given, and then to uh, dive into our presentation, um, provide a little bit of information about our stride clinics, particularly the one in the South Loop that Molly leads, and then um, we will move into the question and answer period. So in addition to both me and Molly who are presenting tonight, um, just to give a quick intro to, to Brad Zellinger, who is the CEO and founder of Stride Autism Centers. Um, and he is kind of the reason that's brought both of us here tonight um, and in, in founding the organization. Um, and we have clinics just as a little bit of a reference to both in Iowa and then in the Chicago uh, location as well turn it over to Molly to start us off. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so I am really excited to talk with you all a little bit about this topic. I think it's something that comes up a lot in discussions with parents and teachers and family members. You know, what is the difference between a challenging behavior? Sometimes people might refer to it as um, problem behaviors or target behaviors. And what are those behaviors that are just simply different that make um, your child unique and special? So we typically look at um, three different criteria for defining a behavior as a challenging behavior. And as something that we really wanna focus our time and our resources um, on teaching the child a more appropriate, sometimes we call it a replacement skill. So the first bullet point that we really focus on is does the behavior interfere with the child's ability to learn? And um, I want to expand on this a little bit because I think oftentimes there are discussions around, um, you know, I might have teachers or parents say, he's, you know, my child isn't able to sit in his chair. He's not able to look at a worksheet and complete it. He's not able to pay attention to the teacher when she's writing on the whiteboard. And um, those are oftentimes, you know, the mediums in which were the modes that our children are learning right now. But I think it's also important to remember that all children, you know, not just kids with autism, learn in a variety of ways. And it's important that we make learning fun and engaging. And so um, that's typically my first question is, are we trying other techniques? Are we trying to accommodate the child and give them other resources or other ways to learn? And if the answer is yes, we've tried so many things and he's still not learning, you know, he's still not building on these skills, then that's when we might consider the behavior to be a challenging behavior that we really need to work on. Um, the other point is, does the behavior interfere with social functioning? And so what I mean by social functioning is, 
is the child unable to establish connections with peers or other kids their own age or siblings? Um, are they not able to establish that social support system because of this behavior, because it's so intense or it's so severe, or um, perhaps it's just occurring so often that it's really impacting their ability to establish relationships with others or get support from others. And the other, um, the last point is obviously safety risk. You know, this is kind of an obvious one. Um, if the behavior is putting the child in danger or in harm, then that's definitely something we would consider challenging behavior. Um, the same goes for other people. If the behavior is putting siblings or family members or caretakers in harm, then we would definitely define it as um, something we need to give our attention and resources on um, teaching them something more appropriate. Um, but the highlight of this, this webinar is just definitely not to be careful, not to confuse challenging behavior with behavior that is just different. So, you know, a lot of our kids just um, have certain behaviors that are unique and special to them that don't necessarily need to be changed or need to be decreased or need to be reduced. Um, a lot of times it's just um, working on our comfort level as well as family members or the community at large in accepting individuals um, that might be different. So this next slide just kind of goes over some examples of challenging behaviors that I'm referring to. Um, a lot of you might be familiar with these. I'll kind of explain some of them in more detail. Um, the first elopement, so running away, um, leaving caregivers, Sometimes this can look like leaving the house. Um, I've worked with some kids that really try and run away from home um, or have to, parents have to get locks on the doors and certain um, safety alarms or running away in community settings, grocery stores, um, parking lots. It's obviously especially dangerous if a child is running away where cars are in the middle of roads. Um, so that is one that kind of goes back to that bullet, bullet point of um, risk of danger and safety. The next one, self-injurious behaviors, or sometimes we refer to it as self-harm. So this is just really any behavior where the child is um, aggressive towards themselves. So sometimes that's head banging or biting um, that can really cause injury. And aggression, so physical aggression towards other people. Um, this can look a, a variety of ways, kicking, hitting, biting, scratching, pulling hair, but it's obviously something we want to um, work on reducing if it's hurting other people. Um, property destruction, this one um, sometimes needs a little bit of context because I've had, you know, um, I've talked with some people and they've said, you know, he's, he's ripping paper up, so we really need to work on property destruction. And some kids just really love to rip paper and they find it super fun. So providing an outlet where they can have, you know, maybe just blank pieces of paper, rip it up, have fun. That's an example of, I would not call that a challenging behavior. Um, something, an example of property destruction that would be, would um, probably be, you know, throwing items in the house or um, knocking over furniture, knocking over tables that could actually lead to significant harm or injury. And then the last one, disrobing. So again, probably not a challenging behavior if it's occurring in your home or possibly in your bedroom, but we would consider it a challenging behavior in a community environment or around um, other individuals. So this next slide um, is really, really important because anytime that we are addressing challenging behaviors, we always want to identify um, what we call the function of the behavior. So why is this behavior even happening? Um, this is so important because anytime these challenging behaviors are happening, it's the child trying to communicate. Um, the child might not have the skills or the communication and language yet to appropriately communicate what's going on. So they then rely on this challenging behavior to do so. Um, so I'll go through each point. Um, the example I'll use here um, would be biting. So the first one is escape or avoidance. 
And from the child's perspective, what that looks like is if I engage in this behavior, so if I bite, I won't have to do this or I'll be able to leave. So an example might be, you know, if a, if a child is entering a very crowded, noisy, overwhelming environment and then engages in aggression and mom and dad say, okay, let's go, time to leave then that child learns, okay, this is how I get to leave. This is how I communicate, hey, I don't like this. The next one, attention. If I engage in this behavior, they'll pay attention to me. So I don't quite know how to get mom and dad's attention or brother and sister's attention, but I do know if I'm aggressive, they look at me and they then play with me and they give me attention. So um, that's, that's that child's way of communicating, hey, pay attention to me. The third one, access to items or activities. Again, if I engage in this behavior, if I engage in aggression, I'll get that toy that I want or that activity. Um, they might not know how to communicate, hey, I want this. Or when we're at the grocery store, I want to say, hey, I want this candy. But if I'm aggressive and then I get it, that's my way of communicating, this is what I want. And then the last one, sensory stimulation. This isn't really um, a, a socially um, reinforced behavior. It's more of um, when the child engages in the behavior, it feels good to them. So I actually worked with a child who um, really got a lot of sensory input from biting. Um, a, he had a variety of chew items that he would use throughout the day. And so when he would bite a staff or a mom or dad, a lot of times it wasn't because he was trying to get attention or he wanted something. He just really liked engaging in that behavior. It provided sensory input to him. And a, an important note here is that there can be more than one function or a function may change depending on the setting. So a child may engage in a challenging behavior for all four of these reasons, and it may depend. You know, in the clinic, it's one reason, and at home, it's another. So um, it's really important for therapists and family members to always communicate with one another and to work together to understand um, what the child is trying to communicate. Thanks, Molly. So these are other things to keep in mind when we're talking about some of these challenging behaviors that might be things that, uh, that families, caregivers are looking to reduce. And so just keeping in mind some of these challenging behaviors and where they are age appropriate is really important too, because we don't wanna to try to eliminate or we, we don't want the expectation that we're gonna fully eliminate some of these behaviors at these ages. Um, setting up that unreasonable expectation for yourself as a caregiver, for your client, um, or for a child is, is not, it's not going to be a reasonable expectation for them to reach. So just some, some examples of that. One of them is biting. Of course, biting can fall into a lot of those categories Molly mentioned earlier. It's unsafe. It also can lead to with mouthing things, you know, Obviously we're worried about germs and, and things like that. So it's not that we want to see biting, it's just unreasonable to expect that that would be at zero levels or that it would never occur for a child who's one or two. That's develop, that's age appropriate at that age. Um, so instead really focusing on ways to keep, keep the child safe, reduce the behavior or to redirect it in a way that, um, that is gonna be more reasonable. Um, but again, not targeting, targeting it necessarily to be at zero. Same with throwing objects, limited communication at this age, oftentimes, as Molly mentioned, these behaviors are a way of communicating. So we always wanna make sure that um, we're seeing behaviors, trying to keep in mind what functions might be there, what, what's trying to be communicated. Um, as you see, tantrums really <laughs> occur across many ages in these early childhood years for, for all children. Um, and I'm sure many parents and caregivers know that out there as well. Um, these are ways to communicate, desiring more independence, wanting to do things themselves. Um, and so it's important to still allow those to happen and not to expect that we would see zero tantrums because then that would be taking away potentially one of the only ways that children of this age can communicate. Um, so again, we might wanna look at looking at changing a level or a setting of how, how some of these behaviors are, are being displayed. So perhaps throwing objects instead, moving any of the unsafe objects out of the environment so that if 
the child is going to turn to throwing objects during a tantrum. They're throwing, like in this picture, a stuffed animal or something that's going to not cause harm, not, not be a safety risk for somebody. Um, and really focusing again on having that safety be the priority rather than trying to change the, um, the behavior immediately or expecting something to change that's, with, that's within that uh, age norm. Another example would be um, some of the competitive behavior that might be seen in ages three and four, and perhaps even some aggression. Again, focusing on keeping, keeping safe, keeping other individuals around safe. And then we'll talk in these future slides about, uh, about communication and redirecting that as well. Um, many of these behaviors are very common. So I think that's the other important message as caregivers too, is to not put too much pressure on oneself um, to get these behaviors at zero or to expect that every child is going to behave exactly as expected in every single situation across all environments. Um, because these, these different um, challenges can be that communication as well. Um, same with the hard time being away from caregiver or sometimes displaying different behaviors in different settings, um, perhaps some anxiety or you know, some, uh, some difficulty being, being away. I think this is something that a lot of families are um, experiencing now, especially because as the world is opening up a little bit more and precautions are changing, that that's confusing for children. And so understanding what the expectations are in different environments and, and being compassionate and understanding that this looks, this looks very different for, um, for different children and different individuals. Um, and again, looking at like what, what might be communicated, being understanding that some of these different behaviors that we as adults or caregivers may view as challenging, trying to kind of refocus it into what, what's being communicated. Um, I do see there's some questions, so we will we'll take some questions at the end too. So um, I do see that there were some messages around that. Um, all right, so, um, and then I also see that, so challenging, I was using challenging in the term of challenging for the parent. So we're viewing this behavior as, the parent is viewing this as a challenging behavior. However, the child is communicating and that's what we're, that's what we're trying to focus on, like what are the behaviors that are truly unsafe and we should be targeting for changing or for redirecting, like biting, we wanna make sure that we wanna reduce that. Um, as much as possible, again, keeping in mind that age appropriateness of it as well. Um, but we're saying challenging in terms of what we often hear is like referral concerns or parents or caregivers coming and saying what's challenging for them and trying to focus on what's challenging for those around in the environment versus what are truly challenges that need to be targeted for, for change. Again, focusing on that like safety um, and those other categories that, that Molly brought up at the beginning. So many times um, these different behaviors are communicating something as we mentioned. And so in particular, it leads to a lot of emotional responding. This is true for essentially anyone in the environment. So it could be emotional responding that's being kind of triggered for the caregiver. So it's part of it is making sure that we're aware of our own reactions and how and what's happening. So these are just some simple steps that can be applied across many different in, um, many different situations and environments. Um, so again, really just pausing as your as a caregiver, as a parent, and taking a deep breath, remaining calm when possible, labeling feelings. So if you're observing, you know, throwing objects or um, something like that, those would be. Oh, it's like you are done with that object, or it look, looks like you feel angry. Um, so either voicing what appears to be the intention of the behavior, like, oh, it looks like you want to stop that, and or labeling those feelings. So again, trying to do that very as objectively as possible and as calmly as possible so that we can start to put some words and labels to what, what some of these behaviors may be communicating. Um, so perhaps, you know, perhaps what the behavior in that particular context is, um, is I'm really mad. Again, trying to kind of keep in mind too the, the vocal, this could this might be vocal language that you're modeling. It might also be that you're modeling using sign or pictures, whatever might be appropriate for that particular learner. So when I'm saying labeling 
also know that I mean that as broad as possible too. Um, so it might be that you're modeling like shaking your head that they that the child is trying to communicate no, they don't want to do something. Um, so trying to to label that and to provide an alternative um, way of potentially communicating that that's safer uh, for them in the future potentially. And then also to try to open up that communication and understanding between the caregiver and the child. Um, so part of it is, is voicing it and or modeling um, that communication, but also teaching an appropriate behavior. So if it's, you know, no thank you, or instead of, let's say it's at mealtime, you know, mealtime is often a struggle for, for many families. Um, so instead of like dumping milk out, instead just maybe moving the milk next time. So even if that happens, remaining calm saying, oh, you don't want milk, and then like moving it to the side instead of dumping it. Um, again, that's dumping milk is not necessarily an unsafe behavior. However, just trying to remain calm and, and putting an alternative forward instead. Um, all right. Another type of behavior that um, is often discussed is stimming. And so what we really want to, and I guess first I'll back up for a second. So stimming can look many different ways. So this might be something like hand flapping or spinning or tapping or often stimming type behaviors that occur. They're rarely a true problem um, or a true challenge, quote, challenging behavior um, in that they're not safe. They're rarely actually interfering with any activities of daily living or learning. It's also really important to remember that many humans engage in repetitive behaviors. So this is one type of repetitive behavior. Many humans engage in this behavior, many adults, probably many of people on this call engage in some type of repetitive behavior, whether it be, you know, leg shaking, um, pen tapping, pen clicking, I know is a really common one. Um, many of those types of behaviors are occurring all the time. Again, like the picture, nail biting, things like that. So there are some that can have potentially like nail biting could potentially be dangerous if, if it's happening to a point where the nails are being bitten really low and it's causing bleeding or perhaps using a hand and not, not hand washing enough and then bringing the hand to your mouth. So there might be some parts of that that could be targeted to become again safer and or used in a way that um, that's going to keep that that child safe and, and um, away from harm. However, the actual like stimming behavior or that sensory stimulus is oftentimes for sensory stimulation is not actually something that needs to be removed fully or, or, um, or eliminated because that is part of what makes your child unique. That's part of what you know, makes each of us unique in terms of what, what types of repetitive behaviors or perhaps things um, that occur, they might also um, communicate some type of um, anxiety or uncertainty in a situation. So that might also be something to, to observe in your child and to see, okay, like when they engage in this behavior, it might mean that they're anxious, it might mean that they're super excited about something. Um, and so if that's a way of communicating the way that they're feeling or thinking, um, then that isn't something we want to eliminate. It's something that we want to um, want to kind of celebrate and make sure that we're, we're keeping as part of what makes your child unique. So in keeping with some of the communication strategies and some other proactive strategies that can be used, uh, focusing on increasing communication can help with any of these different areas. So again, this could be vocal, as I mentioned before in answering the question, it might be related to using sign language, gestures, pictures. Um, this particular visual I, I find to be helpful because it does a lot of the different tips that we've been talking about. It labels the feeling like if I'm feeling frustrated, I need, and then it gives choices for different items to, or different activities to engage in to help calm down. Because it's also, good to remember that taking deep breaths may help one calm down. It doesn't always work. And sometimes if you're really worked up or really angry and someone's like, take a deep breath, 
sometimes that doesn't, that doesn't help at all. That might make you even more angry or more triggered by whatever the situation is that somebody said that to you. So keeping that in mind for, for children and all learners is that, um, is that there are many different ways that people calm down and it is also situationally dependent. So it could be listening to music or bouncing on a ball, taking a deep breath, reading a book or kind of going to a separate area for that, going for a walk, squeezing a stress ball or something like that. Um, so keeping in mind that too, and again, tailoring it to whatever communication needs there might be, um, all while trying to label the feelings, providing alternative situations, uh, alternative activities or an escape from that situation if that's what it appears to be the function of that behavior. Visuals can also help prepare for transitions. So these can be visual, using a visual timer, using some type of schedule. It may also be a vocal reminder. Hey, in five minutes, I use many of these with, with my children, like video games are over in five minutes. We're done watching this YouTube video in two minutes. When this one's over, we're all done. Sometimes the vocal reminders are sufficient for learners. Sometimes they are not, and it's better to have some type of visual reminder of whatever transition is coming. And preparing for those proactively and in advance can help make some of those, those challenges in terms of some emotional responding or, um, or perhaps just feeling unprepared for that transition. It can help alleviate some of that in advance of it even happening. Um, another important piece that sometimes is overlooked and is difficult as a caregiver is to praise or reinforce what communication is occurring. So it could be that your child or the learner um, says, I'm mad and still throws something. So you're seeing the communication, which is great, the labeling of the feeling, the thing that you may have been working towards, you're also still seeing a, a behavior that you, maybe they're throwing something like out a window or something that's unsafe and it needs to be shifted or changed. Making sure that we're also recognizing and praising the labeling piece of it can be really challenging in those different situations for, for a caregiver. So recognizing like, I'm, you know, thanks for saying you're mad, what, you know, and either redirecting it vocally, modeling what that behavior might look like differently in the future, um, using visual supports or perhaps, you know, signing no or saying, you know, no throwing, whatever that, that label is for, for your learner or for your family um, in trying to kind of redirect while also trying to take the opportunity to provide some praise or acknowledging um, the opportunities that, that some of those feelings or labels have been communicated. Um, one way that we kind of take many of these different pieces and bring them into our clinics is through this model, our STRIDE model. And I'm going to turn it over to Molly and she'll tell us a little bit more about what each of the letters stands for and how, how that kind of looks in relation to some of these, these challenges or some of the difficult behaviors and as kids are learning to communicate how that looks in our centers. Thanks, Ashley. Um, so as she said, this is um, and quick infographic that we have throughout our clinic and that we go over um, when we bring in our behavior techs and our new therapists. And these are techniques that we practice every day in our clinic to foster more positive interactions with our learners. Um, the first one for S, shape approximations. And so what we mean by that is to um, reinforce and praise um, any type of behavior that gets that child closer to their ultimate goal. So an example here, you know, a lot of our parents are really wanting to focus on potty training. And when you think about going from diapers to full potty training, no accidents, a lot of times that can feel overwhelming. And um, so we always want to focus on creating, you know, those small steps and really praising that child each time they, um, they achieve a step that brings them closer to their ultimate goal. Um, an example, you know, with that is one of our learners is just having a hard time even transitioning to the bathroom. 
So right now we're not even focusing on the actual potty training, sitting on the toilets, pulling pants up and down. We're just working on being comfortable going into the bathroom. And when he goes into the bathroom, we have a big party. And so that is our way of shaping that approximation that leads him towards that ultimate goal of, of potty training. For T, we have teach for generalization. And so what that means is we practice skills um, across a variety of environments with a variety of individuals and um, using a, a mixture of materials. So it's not gonna be helpful for our children if they are learning a new skill and they're only able to do that with one behavior therapist and only in the clinic. So it's super important we have parent training for at least an hour every week so that we can teach our parents, hey, this is how we're teaching this skill. This is how we're having your child practice it. So then they're learning that same skill at home with mom and dad, and it creates a more robust, or as we call it, it's a mastered skill. So they're able to practice that behavior, not only with us, not only at the clinic, but at home or at school with teachers as well. For R, we have um, reinforced socially significant behaviors. Um, this is probably my favorite one um, of, the, um, of the different techniques. I think it's really, really important when we're working with learners to focus on behaviors that are socially significant, that are important to that child and that family. Um, I, an example here, I, I think culture really plays a big part into this. Um, I was actually talking with a, a dad and we were looking over an assessment and something mentioned eye contact. And he said, actually, you know, that's not at all important to us. We actually find it rude if he makes eye contact with us while we're communicating with him. And so that was super important for me to know. That was not a socially significant behavior. It wasn't something that we needed to focus on. Um, or it's not a, a skill we needed to really develop. So we always want to ask that question, what behavior is socially significant and important to the child and their family? Um, I incorporate diverse learning opportunities. So this is huge at the clinic. Um, every, um, every activity, every part of our day is an opportunity to learn. You know, we don't spend all of our time sitting at the table looking at flashcards. Um, we want to make sure that we're learning our colors when we're taking walks outside and we're learning our shapes when we are at the sink washing our dishes after lunch. Um, so it's, you know, tons of activities that we do during the day. They're all opportunities for the child to practice skill development, practice communication, um, and to learn in, in a variety of ways. And then D, decide based on the data. So um, at the clinic, um, we take data on the skills that we're really focusing on and the behaviors that we're targeting all throughout the day. Um, so we are writing down and we actually send home a form with parents and communicate with parents. This is the um, progress in numbers on this specific skill. So um, if we're really working on teaching the child to communicate, hey, I need help, then we're going to take data all throughout the day. Like, hey, he said it independently all by himself or he needed a little bit of help. We had to give him the, the first sound. Um, and so that lets us know, is the child making progress? Is he starting to learn this skill on his own? Is he engaging in it, in it independently? We can always go back to the numbers and the data and make decisions for transitions. Is this child ready for a preschool program or a kindergarten program? Rather than relying on our gut or intuition or trying to decide what's best, we can really look at our graphs and our data to make that decision and understand when um, a transition is necessary. And then the last one, encourage communication. This is um, always so important. Um, as we've talked about in this webinar, a lot of the um, you know, challenging behaviors that we often see are simply because the child doesn't quite know how to communicate their wants and needs yet. And so that is a, a big focus, um, if not one of the most important focuses of um, our services is teaching the child a more appropriate, as I said, replacement skill or just teaching the child to communicate rather than having to engage in a challenging behavior when they want to leave a, an overwhelming environment or when they really want something and they don't know how to say, hey, I want that toy or hey, I don't like this place. I really want to leave. 
Um, that is our, our primary goal, is giving those children the tools to communicate with us and with family members. Um, and so we always want to create those opportunities. Um, something that parents are really, really great at is knowing what their kids want and need at all times. Um, it's like a superpower. I, I feel like every time a parent comes in, they're like, oh, can you go grab his milk? That's what that means. And that's amazing. I th also think it's so important for um, parents to pause and say, okay, tell me, say, I want milk. Or, um, you know, some kids have different ways of communicating. Maybe it's through pictures or maybe it's through a communication device or maybe it's through sign language. So finding what's best for your child and providing opportunities for them to sign or hand you a picture for milk or say, hey, I want milk even if you already know, really giving them that opportunity to practice that communication um, every day is, is so important. Thanks Molly for, uh, for that summary as well. Here is some of the information for Stride and for our South Loop location. If you are looking for any more information, um, on Stride Centers overall, there's the website. And also if you have any additional questions, please feel free to reach out. We would love to hear from you.